that will be reported out into public. So I've I've enjoyed I've enjoyed very much uh, the, the series of conversations we've had. So today um, we've pulled together um, people from various who have worked on various government services, and I think maybe I could get each of the them to introduce themselves. Um, maybe Audrey, can I start with you? Yeah, certainly. Uh, and officially, I only began recording like now, so okay. <laughs> the off the record conversation wasn't part of the video. Um, yeah, I'm Audrey Tang. I'm a digital minister in charge of social innovation, open government, and youth engagement, which really is the same thing anyway to me. Uh, and really happy to be here. Thank you. Um, and Beth. Hi, Beth Novak. Uh, currently serving as the chief innovation officer for the state of New Jersey was previously the Deputy Chief Technology Officer and the Head of Open Government for the Obama Administration. I've also advised both the uh, German Chancellor Angela Merkel and um, uh, and worked for David Cameron, Prime Minister of the UK. And in my capacity as Head of the GovLab, I work with governments around the world on digital transformation and governance innovation. Thanks. Thanks. And Hal? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Hal Seki from Code for Japan. I'm a founder of Code for Japan, and uh, Code for Japan is a, a non-profit organization for facilitating the speak tech activities in Japan. And also, uh, I'm working for the uh, digital agency Japan uh, as a, a project manager of Code for Japan, uh, Code, Code, uh, project manager of the uh, speak tech activities. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Miyata Sensei, who's my co chair, maybe you can introduce yourself too. Yeah, <clears throat> my name is Miyata. Uh, my major is uh, data science as well as a scientific method to improve the real world. And uh, let us quickly introduce the concept of the co innovation architecture design uh, conference. Uh, this, uh, yes, we like to upgrade the concept of the smart city. So, that what is smart? The smart is a uh, uh oh yeah uh for the industry or the fit for the big stakeholder we we would like to change the concept for the people centric and also there uh the aims is not for the uh, such kind of the economies or the uh, profits just for the well-being sustainable future and the health uh, well-being and diversity inclusion we set up uh our aims uh like the such kind of upper layer and the club light together and the concept is uh, uh not only the physical world but also the utilizing the metaverse on the such kind of the virtual community and network and the set so we would like to develop the multi-layered democracy through uh, such kind of the uh new co-innovation architecture uh method thank you very much Thank you, Miyata Sensei. And I think this is a maybe a good place to kick off. I'll, I'll pick certain topics, but again, feel free to sort of take the conversation into slightly different areas. But um, first of all, I think the title is important, and this is something that um, Miyata San and I and others have kind of worked on to develop. And it's um, so the idea of co innovation and mm -hmm. architecture and design are all pretty important yeah. words for us. And I think. Um, Co-innovation, I think, is key because up till now, government services have been mostly centrally planned. And as as one way of saying it, it's been very supply side oriented. It's kind of like um, designed um, by and for the people who have the power. And the idea of co-innovation, which is you know could be co-design or um, uh, people centric design, is uh, you know the government has started to say it, uh, which is good, but it's not clear that we really know how to do it. And so that would be one of the really important topics uh, to talk about. And, and I, I guess we could kind of start there if people are okay. I mean, I think, you know, I know Audrey, you've um, shared with me in the past, a lot of the ways that you've engaged citizens in um, in design, but I, I but maybe Sixan since, so Sixan runs, is, is in a really interesting position, I think, um, which is Code for Japan is, I think, one of the largest groups that do community oriented hackathons and design, but he's also, you know, right in the middle of the digital agency working on projects and uh, uh, materials, the term co-design, but I'm not sure, maybe you can report a little bit on what's the state 
of sort of design practices and co-design in Japan. And then maybe we can hear from Beth and uh, Audrey uh, examples and advice on how we might make it better. Okay, so let me share quickly about the situation of the co-innovation between the citizen and the government in Japan. And as a uh, Code for Japan founded uh, in 2013, and uh, gradually the uh, uh, the citizen side uh, of the uh, citizen side uh, communities are growing. Uh, we have uh, uh, around 19, uh, uh, 19 local code for communities and they are working uh, with the local government level. And there are some uh, good uh, examples uh, about the uh, co-innovative uh, project. And uh, we created some uh, uh, tools uh, as an open source and, and, and uh, but uh, but the recently, uh, I feel that uh, there are many of the projects are uh, uh, led by the uh, uh, blunt, voluntary groups, and uh, the, the government uh, doesn't know uh, how to collaborate with them uh, as a, a foundation level, and and also the we have some uh, difficulty about uh, making. Uh, uh good uh, policy uh, together uh, still the uh the policy level the uh, planning is uh, uh, led by the uh, top level uh, decision making process and student doesn't uh, students are not much involved in that process so so that we started uh, uh a project uh, called uh, make our city project and 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 provide some tools uh, like uh, Decidim. It is open source uh, civic engagement tools uh, born in Barcelona. Uh, but still, uh, it that activity is, is, is are, are weak and no budget budgeting uh, from the uh, many of government. Uh, yeah, we are still uh, challenging to uh, create the policies together. And Audrey, do you want to go next on some of the things that have been worked for you in kind of getting citizens uh, to participate in design and policy as well? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, for, first of all, I think I thank you for this uh, new branding of co-innovation. It's a brand new SEO term uh, that we're free to add no more meanings to. Uh, and in a kind of previous iteration, when it was still called social innovation, agile, co-governance, and so on, uh, I, I've had a conversation with uh, Metty folks. I just pasted it to the chat. Uh, it's published on the MBO magazine in both languages, uh, English and Japanese, uh, that talk broadly about the same same ideas. So I'll just highlight uh, two points. Um, the first is that the civil service, the public civil servants in the front line in those local areas, they probably already have all the required innovation figured out. It's just they don't have the political support or the budget or the public communication expertise or whatever uh, to realize uh, those innovations. So uh, to me, one of the most important thing in regional rejuvenation or revitalization uh, is to get them a safe space to get those ideas um, let's say, escalated or amplified uh, on the national forum so that they get the mandate that they would need to convince their mayors. This has been the, the most important thing that we've seen in contact tracing, in vaccination, in mass distribution, and so on. The, the, the same patterns repeat itself so much so that we organized the presidential hackathon around this very principle of public service co-innovation. So that's my first point. My second point is that when people see the good idea, the good models, and so on, they're going to ask, so how are we going to fund those things? And in Taiwan, uh, we're basically uh, using this idea that we call pay for success. I know it has at least seven different names, uh, like uh, like retroactive public good funding or, or whatever, right? Uh, the, 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 there's some somebody who, who says it's kind of a debt, uh, but it's not really a debt, it's an investment and so on, that is co-created, co-designed. Uh, and uh, we basically ask the 
private sector to fund to help fund these uh, in the expectation of a contract of a return by the government when these innovation actually um, you know uh, create social values that could be at least uh, monetized uh, in in such a way or, or it's not really monetized it's dollarized right to so you can put a social return of investment on it now the the crux of the matter is to get a people public private partnership where the people set a norm in which that the public sector as the private sector to put a kind of dollar amount on the time is saved on the uh, budget is saved and so on so that we can actually pay out and we structure it like a award uh, not a particular grant and that's the structure that we've been uh, engaging the youth uh, in making sure that they participate in the regional rejuvenation um, attempts uh, without worrying too much about the initial capital investment uh, because the traditional VCs uh, unless we design something like pay for success would not put money into it so that's just my two very brief points thanks Audrey and I might have more questions about that I will follow up I'll read this first and then follow up but um, Beth I don't know if you have experience in this space that you could share for us <laughs> I've written three books on the topic, Joey, so plenty of experience. And uh, we're tomorrow running a co-design project that we've done uh, most recently in five cities in Mexico, previously in five cities in Africa. Tomorrow I'm running the same project in California to co-design solutions to urban challenges uh, between government and residents. Um, and I'm happy to share more details on this, but let me, uh, on the model that we use for doing this kind of co-design work, um, but let me share two, three kind of broader points here. Um, one is that I think it's very important to recognize that there are different types of co-design or collective intelligence or engagement or whatever we term we want to use. Um, and to be very clear about when we're trying to engage in human-centered design versus crowdsourcing versus open innovation versus collaboration. Um, so it's, I think, just crucial to be clear on whether the goal is to try to identify a problem or to solve a problem together or to implement a, pro a, a solution to a problem or to evaluate collectively what is or isn't working. For these different stages of um, policy implementation or project management, uh, it's just useful to have the right platform and it becomes very easy to use the wrong platform for the wrong purpose or the wrong process for the wrong purpose. So I think starting from the perspective of what are you trying to accomplish um, is incredibly useful as just a basic idea for knowing what kind of a co-design process to implement, number one. Number two, I think it's recognizing, as you explained at the outset, Joey, that a lot of uh, the discussions about co-design are still what I would call lip service. People are talking about it, but they don't have experience doing it. They haven't been trained in how to do it in university or in graduate school. It's not part of the job description. So if you're coming out of a tech culture and you know what a hackathon is, uh, it's one thing, but people in government are not trained in this way. So I think training is extraordinarily important. That's where some of uh, Audrey's work around the participation officers network and teaching people how to co-design and co-create is just so crucial. So. I wouldn't underestimate the importance of talent and capacity building to be able to do co-design, just as we know that you need some training in data science to be able to use data and open data, you need training to be able to engage in co-design. So I'll stop just by putting a link in the chat, not to any of the things I mentioned, but to something else, which is a series of global case studies of uh, governments co-designing with residents around the world, and then um, a, a guide, a short, short and longer paper that we did with Nesta on sort of what are the lessons learned from that. Uh, so if you click on the report, you'll see there's a short guide. We have everything summarized in one picture, um, but there's a lot of really interesting global cases around how people are doing different things like 
defining a problem together or solving a problem together. So let me stop with that. Excellent. Thank you. And and just as a process point, I'll I'll inject that um, I'm going to do a, a Joey styled conversation style discussion. So if anybody has anything to say, there's little there's a little smiley face and there's a a thing to raise your hand. So just raise your hand if you have something to say. Otherwise, we're just going to go sort of free association because one of the topics I think that I wanted to cover as well that Beth started talking about, which is um, capacity building and training and learning. And I think that um, one of the problems that I see quite often in um, in addition to just lip service is, um, you know, very well meaning um, uh, uh, decisions and discussions that this is what needs to happen without any real mechanism of how it's going to happen. And so a lot of these reports, including the one that we're going to be feeding into, I can imagine we'll have a lot of very visionary ideas, including co-design, with, without any real who's going to do it and how they're going to do it. And one of the things that I see is capacity building is always the second thing after, you know, okay, here's what we need to do. But um, but it's but Beth, as you say, I mean, I think there's um, like traditional capacity building is just feeding people information that then they consume. But I don't think that's the way that people learn how to do things like co-design and I'm curious, sort of, I, I, I know that, and, and by the way, the, sending us links is great because these are all things that we can uh, consume um, and uh, we'll put them in the report. Uh, but if you have um, either links or ideas on, on what have been effective ways, because um, I think of things like with pair programming, I always think is wonderful because at the end of, you know, several months, you have twice as many people who know how to do it. You know, if you can keep adding people to this ongoing thing, but I wonder for co-design, and, and, and again, given that, as you say, there are many different types of co-design and co-innovation, but just for any category, have you found um, what is the most effective way to increase capacity, both in government as well as in, in, in local regions? I don't know. Who, what you, please go ahead if anybody wants to jump in. Yeah. Can yeah. I? Go, how's that? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I, yeah, I agree that the uh, the uh, the working together is really important to uh, uh, cultivate the trust with the uh, people uh, and the government uh, officials and and i i suggest the i i i, I often suggest the the local government to have a field to work together uh, with the students uh, and uh, 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 for example uh Tokyo Metropolitan Government uh, recently organized uh, uh, a hackathon and and invite uh, uh, local officials, uh, local government officials, and and uh, and the developers and also the students, and and I, I see the uh, people uh, inside the government realize uh, all, all student is uh, not. Uh, uh, it student uh, some of students are very much uh, 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 has uh, uh, intense uh, intense to work to, uh, work uh, and and making make a uh, make a city better place and, and after they realized that uh, kind of the collaborations uh, uh, they their mind uh, became uh, became open uh, and. I, I think it's important to create such kind of the uh, uh, field uh, to uh, work uh, with the citizens, and not only just discussion. Mm -hmm. I mean, Beth, I don't know if you have any thoughts on, um, you know, the role of hackathons. I mean, this is something that Code for Japan does really well, and um, or Audrey as well. I mean, I, and, and I and I guess maybe if I interpret a little bit of what Hal is saying is, um, first of all, building the trust that you develop when you're actually working together on something, I think, is a very good first step before you get to more sophisticated things like uh, platforms and uh, um, project management systems. But I'm curious whether you have any thoughts on where you go, how how to go from hackathon or first of all how to do a good hackathon and then how to go from hackathon to uh, more uh, uh, let's call them um, you know core uh, services that we might be able to deploy I don't know if you have any I 
I think the lesson for the lesson for hackathons um, or for any kind of engagement is the same, which is you have to make it relevant. Um, what works so well about I'm gonna I'm gonna sing Audrey's praises because it's uh, because she's here and it's fun to do, and better than talking only about myself. Um, what's uh, well, I'll, I'll give some other examples too, since Audrey can talk best about her stuff. But the the great part about what Audrey does is there's an outcome to it. It's not citizen engagement or participation for its own sake. The fact that Taiwan has the example of saying we've crafted 26 pieces of national legislation as a result of co-design is much more powerful, frankly, than all of these conversations about, you know, French citizens assemblies um, where none of the recommendations go anywhere. And similarly, what makes for a bad hackathon is a bunch of people making apps that nobody's going to use. Um, so I think the important thing is not to wind up the machinery of engagement or open innovation, co-design, co-creation um, without the ability to explain how it's how it's useful. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to promise to use everything people tell you. Um, you just have to be able to explain the purpose. So tomorrow, I just came from a two-hour meeting to plan. We have 30 groups in the room tomorrow, and we're asking them to spend two days with us designing an engagement. And we have to, all of the work goes into explaining to them, preparing how to explain to people why we're going to uh, tr you know, treat their time with care and with respect and why, what the outcomes will be. So it's about clarity of instructions and directions, clarity of workflow, um, and having thought through the process ahead of time. And that, to come back to the original question, is why the training is so important. Because you need to teach people how to do that and how to articulate that kind of an agenda. Um, even or especially with something more basic like human-centered design, where I'm just asking you maybe to test a website for me or asking you some questions so I can design a better website or service. Uh, you know, the best practice is the ability to explain to somebody how their input is going to be used and potentially when needed to pay them for their time. But that's another topic. Um, and to be sure that you're inviting the right people, which we can get into. But I think long story short, make it relevant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah, thank you very much. Uh, I uh, deeply respect uh, your uh, project, uh, such a uh, pay for success or the, uh, the hackathon and empowerment people. It's very important, I think. And on the other hand, uh, we, we like uh, we better uh, also better to develop the uh, platform to uh, utilizing uh, such kind of, uh, to create the share co-create shared value. So the uh, the best already say it's uh, like uh, uh, the, such kind of purpose is a uh, very important. And so sometimes uh, we uh, play on the Google platform or the Meta platforms, but, but uh, such kind of economic driven uh, platform algorithm. Some sometimes uh, uh, the purpose is uh, uh, for the money, and so stay longer, uh, make much money. But uh, we uh, sometimes dis uh, we discuss with them about the how uh, we concur uh, that. So uh, what is the social good? And so sometimes uh, we like to share the data and also the, uh, make co-create algorithm for the sustainable future or the uh, well-being. So the economic uh, purpose is the second or the third one. So such kind of the purpose setting platform uh, co-innovation is an important topic for the, uh, the next step, I think. Actually, can I toss this to you, Audrey? Because in our podcast discussion, you um, made a very interesting point about how purpose-driven education is actually more like is is upstream, from my, in my view, than project-based learning. And you were you were describing how children 
in schools start with a purpose and then develop a project and then learn to code. And I, I thought that path was very interesting. And I, I'm, I'm very curious how you think about purpose in this sort of context that we're talking and maybe capacity building too. Yeah, certainly. So um, I, I'll use a very concrete example um, of next year, actually this year, this year's presidential hackathon. Uh, presidential hackathon 2022 uh, is um, funded by the National Science Council, similar to the National Science Foundation. Uh, the uh, uh, actual implementer is the Ministry of Interior. Uh, and it's only on open data and data pipelines and privacy enhancing technology and so on uh, does the digital ministry uh, come to play. So, so this is a very clear uh, kind of strata, right? The, the National Science Council does this um, shared goals uh, definition, co-definition. Uh, it's firmly on the problem identification phase. The Ministry of Interior, because the theme of the hackathon is, I don't know how to translate, but anyway, it's a cohabitable, uh, balanced Taiwan. So so basically, regional rejuvenation, same as your topic. Uh, so uh, we have two uh, phases. One is multi-month, uh, what we call the idea song, uh, where uh, we engage the, the artists, the, the poets, the movie makers, the, the game makers, or whatever. Uh, and, and their job is not to produce any code although I think some code will still be involved, uh, but, but rather to, to clarify the vision uh, and to put into um, visual or interactive arts uh, what people's collaborative wish are, and we reward uh, the best articulated visions. And then the code development and design proof of concept part take those visions, because at that point, the vision is already kind of president certified. They know that they will get funding that that, uh, that puts into the uh, National Science Foundation, National Science Council's uh, way of kind of emerging tech funding, innovation funding track. So by that time, they already know that there will be budget allocated to this, whether it's television medicine or teleeducation or things like that. And then when it concerns uh, private data and things like that, well, then the digital ministry comes to play, but not before. The, the most important thing is not before, uh, because otherwise, uh, basically solutionism enters the space and then uh, smart citizens become uh, trapped in smart cities and they become less smart citizens, right? So, so that's the, the, the general flow of work. Now, in day-to-day -day, uh, detailed terms, this can work because we have well-trained participation officer teams. I've pasted uh, more than 100 different collaboration meetings that we've done together and they always, again, begin by a wish uh, proposed by a citizen, but of course local public servants are also citizens. Uh, they propose many uh, interesting things. And the pain points, the problem is often government cost, right? Whether it's a bad tax filing system, whether it's uh, blocking mountaineers from, from entering the indigenous spaces uh, for good reason, I'm sure, but not well explained uh, or a, a very bad ocean policy that makes it very difficult for people to find uh, what activity they can do or whatever. Uh, they, they are government cost problems, which means that the government can solve them. Uh, and then when we enter the collaboration meetings, the breakout groups are facilitated not by the participation officer of the ministry involved, but rather by totally unrelated ministries, and this is by design. So when we co-created tax uh, filing uh, together, maybe the ocean god, the, the uh, coastal god, uh, host the breakout group. Uh, and But when we talk about ocean policy, maybe it's the tax agency's participation officer. Uh, and the reason why is that the Coastal Guard also files their own tax and suffers from it. The tax agency officer also likes surfing, right, and fishing and things like that. So um, the citizens, when they enter this workshop, both online and face-to-face, -face, they feel that their breakout group leader, A, knows a lot about public service, and B, is actually on citizen side. Uh, and, and then that's a very empowering move because then those participation officers really feel that they have solved the problems uh, by not breaking out of their own silos but starting outside of those silos. Uh, and so I think that's one of the men mentalities that could really uh, be fostered very easily if you just design uh, your co-creation groups by facilitating with uh, senior or at least mid-level public officials well outside of the silo, but themselves uh, represents the same values that the local citizen have. And, and, and this is a question both to you and to Beth, um, but th 
the you were saying the training of these participation officers, and it sounds like you have a design practice that's also being developed. I mean, how do you capture these, uh, let's call them um, design practices, and then how do you then train people? And I know Beth has been coordinating across countries. So I'm curious, you know, one, how that's done, and two, whether we can learn uh, more practically uh, how we might do this in Japan. I don't know, Audrey or Beth, either. Uh, I'll... Oh, Audrey, you first, and then I'll go okay. change it up. Sure. Rose. Right. Go. So, um, yeah, we, we've been documenting everything, right? And, and that's part of the radical transparency thing. So for each and every collaboration meeting, if you click into the CM side, you will see uh, the mirror map, the, the mind map, uh, the uh, full transcript of what has transpired, uh, sometimes a live streaming record and things like that. So uh, basically, we publish the preparation stages by capturing it. Uh, initially, uh, using uh, like uh, human transcribers, but nowadays, just like our WebEx, we're using more and more um, assistive intelligence uh, in capturing those um, things, which is actually very easy if you invest uh, into the right microphones. But because of the COVID this year, everybody has good microphones, so that makes things easier. So the, the point I'm, I'm making is that you don't need to actually uh, consciously document it. Just make sure that you have people who work remotely and make it a habit uh, to start a conversation saying this will be on the record and actually put it on the record. And then afterwards, it's very easy actually to use some simple machine learning to create a site like uh, our CM site so that everybody can go back to a uh, wildly popular um, citizens initiative e petition or whatever and find out exactly what has transpired before that meeting because everything uh, before that meeting is also documented and the public servants they, they are very intelligent people they, they just learn from these materials uh, of course we do organize workshops and things like that i think having the raw materials that they can relate to is very important interesting that's excellent I, beth i don't know if you and also help maybe after beth do you have any any patterns that you can share that you would? As far recommend? as document uh, documenting learnings, um, we've been trying to, I think there's sort of two ways in which we do that. One is um, by having learning be a central focus, it means we're constantly in that process of trying to figure out lessons learned. Uh, and we do that through, you know, do th things like writing case studies, but then we turn the case studies into podcasts. Um, and we turn them into one pagers because we know that the busy government professionals we work with don't have time or interest to read long case studies. Um, so we try to distill things into very short forms. We're also trying to create more of a library of examples that we can use for teaching and training. Um, so I'll put, uh, oops, wrong link. Let me find the link. Um, I'll put a link to one of the earlier uh, we've been doing a lot of skills training for a long time, but then when I took this latest role in government, one of the first things I did, uh, some of you have seen this, was to build a skills training platform. And so we were taking the lessons we were learning and turning them into short videos that we could then share with people. But then we turned the videos into uh, a series of live master classes, which we're now doing across states. Uh, and now we're starting a new project with UNDP to do this across countries. Um, so we're, we're constantly sort of taking what we're learning from practice and turning it into teaching materials. Uh, and we have a team that's just become really good at kind of writing scripts and editing them and, and um, sort of creating learning objects, if you will, uh, out of um, out of these experiences. Um, and so what happens is we start people with a very, very brief introduction to something like a 10 minute video about co-design. And then that gets them more interested. And then they, what happens is we just did, for example, an eight part course on co-designing solutions uh, to problems. So it's, we, we try to graduate people from a little bit of content to uh, kind of a little bit of something in your own time to something live and a little bit longer to something slightly longer. And then we graduate from there to coaching, which is now that we've introduced you to some of these skills around co-design as well as uses of data, 
um, we then work with you to uh, learn how to apply this to your own projects. So we've started doing office hours where you can come with a project you're working on and we kind of coach you through how to apply these skills to your own work. Um, so it's the interplay between kind of doing and learning at the same time that I think is uh, really useful, but having a team that can extract, extract the experiences and turning, turn it into something shareable that's very helpful. Interesting. I don't know, Sekisan, do you have any learnings from uh, Code for Japan maybe that we can think about in government? Uh, yeah, uh, I think the the teaching uh, is really important. Uh, and I uh, we have a, a kind of the workshops for the local government officials called uh, Data Academies and uh, uh, GovTech academies, and uh, we have similar program, uh, and and, uh, and we we, we uh, have a series of workshops for the local officials and uh, invite them and uh, and uh, teach them and also uh, not only teach we, and also we uh, we work with them and solve their local programs, and and because. Uh, the, they they have no time to uh, only learn uh, new things so so that they have to solve their uh, problems uh, and so so that we uh, we work with them and and try to solve the small problem with them using the uh, data uh, uh, data visualization or or using some uh, uh, RPAs or, or some other techniques and and I, I have a question to uh, uh, Beth, and and the difficult point is the public officials are too busy to learn this kind of new things, and there are no fields to try what they they learned. So so the government uh, give official support for the uh, learners or some kind of kind of mandatory. Uh, things uh, to learn new things it's a really good point uh i don't know the situation in taiwan i can tell you that in which i hope you'll tell us uh in singapore learning is mandatory and there is a real culture of learning the sense that i will fall behind uh, i will fall behind the private sector if i don't learn if i don't train and learn training is treated as a reward. You get selected to be part of a course. It's a big honor to be picked. Um, so it becomes something competitive. In Argentina, they give you uh, points, uh, like frequent flyer points for courses that you take, and that translates into economic raises. So you don't get promoted without learning. Um, in Germany, it's a little different in that they, it's, it's free, it's again, their requirements for training and it's part of your collective bargaining agreement as part of the public sector unions um, that, you tr that you do get to do training. And so it's something, I think it's still a struggle and getting people to do the right training. And what we lack for sure in the United States, we don't have, unlike in Singapore and Canada and some other places, we don't have a strategy or a vision. No one says in the 21st century, we think it's really important for public servants to know how to use data and how to engage with citizens, or it's really important to know digital skills. Um, in Singapore, they've said, we think it's important for public servants to know how to code. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that's the right thing, frankly, but I really like the fact that they've picked something and that there's a vision for what to do, um, which we completely lack in the United States. So in the U.S., there's no incentive, there's no requirement, there's no vision. And so you really just have no culture of learning, particularly. Mm -hmm. And then when people get busy, it's the very first thing that you stop doing is you stop uh upskilling basically all right thank you how do you yeah Go. yeah i just pasted a link it's a metro map for learning for public service 
uh, and the social innovation line is line F, uh, but next to it is the line G, the assistive intelligence line, and there's also lines on circular economy and uh, emerging technologies and things like that. If you click on those stops, uh, it will show you the master classes, the workshops, and things like that. We, we've tried to gamify it. It's a lot of fun, and it also shows the synergies uh, between those concepts and case studies and the resource that you can tap into uh, to start your own presidential hackathon uh, initiatives and so on. So uh, I think making it fun is really the important thing. We're all experts here in the public service to make things uh, fair and we're working on making it fast, uh, but fun is something that's uh, that's really required if you want the very busy public servants uh, to feel like this has something to do with their job. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, as for mandatory, I think for the uh, kind of work working mid-level uh, public servants uh, to become uh, managers uh, in Taiwan. It's mandatory for them to go into a multi-month uh, kind of problem-solving workshop uh, using these metros lines as guides and basically uh, as if they're on their own director journal and what would you do? And so I got a lot of interviews from those uh, people who are just becoming uh, more top-level senior managers because they have to essentially write their thesis, um, for example, how to make uh, future uh, payouts to uh, the health insurances uh, as fair and fun as the mask distribution, uh, or whether the National Health Insurance Administration can serve as an internal cloud provider, and so on. So, so these are, are all uh, uh, defined by themselves. It's not an assignment of any kind, but they have to defend their thesis in order to be promoted into senior management. It's very cool. Hi, Miyata-san, sensei. Thank you very much for your great practice. And uh, so uh, I, I believe uh, your practice is great. And also the most important is just empower uh, innovators and the early adapters. So the, from perspective of social marketing, it's it's a uh, op optimal uh, way to uh, spread the new idea for the world. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in Japan, especially in Japan, it's a hyper-aging society already. And many people thinking about uh, the late majority of the Lagarde. Uh, uh, Sometimes we, we should uh, include uh, such kind of the uh, people. So just uh, start a cutting-edge uh, project from the uh, innovators, area of the, it's, it's a per perfect and essential. On the other hand, on the other hand, how uh, do you include uh, such kind of the, uh, the people who don't want it to uh, collaborate together or the participate together and or, or this lack of motivation to uh, develop a new democracy? So. I'll take a stab at it. Um, so, oh, so, so that, that's my question. So, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. So, so I was yesterday just in Pindong, and this is the mayor of the Pindong County. There's a small video um, uh, down down the below the food, uh, and mm -hmm. so uh, aside from me donning indigenous nation uh, head stuff and uh, uh, cooking together and and so on, oh. uh, what what was trying to show is that uh, this is a, a, a primary school uh, that a lot of the seniors in in their 70s and so on, uh, they were educated there, uh, but because of the age society and Pingdong being the southmost of Taiwan, uh, there's no sufficient uh, school children uh, to sustain that school anymore. So basically, we collaboratively with the Ministry of Education and Interior uh, reopened the school uh, so that it's a public park-ish now. So, uh, and the point here is that the senior people, they when they go back to their um, primary school, that uh, in their memory, uh, they can still see the pineapple fields are still there, everything is there, but next to the field, and literally without walls, so you can't ignore that, uh, is some uh, agricultural uh, helicopters, uh, drones, and so on, uh, and that are basically the, the South Taiwan's uh, main license uh, field for license operators, pilots of agriculture-related drones, and they get to see the pineapple fields themselves can be painted into rainbow color or whatever color uh, to attract tourists and things like that.
Okay, so so basically, it, it put it somewhere they can't ignore. It, it's just their alum, right? Their primary school. Uh, it's uh, in one of the most central places, so so they just walk uh, next to it. I think it won some design awards uh, in architecture. Uh, and by the night, uh, when they gather at just like a public park, uh, they then are mingled um, automatically uh, with the young people, who then will listen to their pain points and then start their social entrepreneurship. Uh, proposals based on the uh, seniors' uh, ideas or seniors' pain points and so on. So, so the point is that we can't really, uh, you know, uh, really convince uh, people of different generations uh, uh, to change their priorities. But we can do uh, a, a collaborative kitchens so that simply by showing up, uh, the formed uh, shared goals uh, are uh, first and foremost in people's minds instead of particular solutions. Uh, we don't actually do pedagogy in the sense of teaching people new solutions. We, we instead do co-learning in which that uh, the local people just uh, share their problems over dinner and uh, it also makes the indigenous people and other people who are kind of strictly speaking uh, less uh, well represented in the city council level and things like that uh, feel this sense of intersectionality because people younger 18 are also unrepresented and so on. So there's this natural solidarity going around when you have spaces like this. And my uh, own office in the Social Innovation Lab is the same, right? We literally tore down the wall of an Air Force headquarters to convert it to the public park so people can come and, and play basketball or whatever and cook together. So. Uh, in short, having something that uh, is a public park and you can cook together and then everything else could follow. Great, great. Uh, thank you very much. So such kind of the utilizing the multi-layered culture is, a, I think, it's a brilliant idea. So we are also uh, developing a live level in the rural area. So uh, we are just uh, considering the moving bookshelves. So sometimes so you already say the food culture, sometimes old people uh, gather together, uh, never uh, communicate with the uh, uh, newcomers. But uh, when we uh, share the food cultures, uh, old people know that what is the best timing for the fruits and the new people know the various type of uh, way of uh, cooking and gather together and uh, uh, co-create uh, new and uh, delicious ones. So such kind of the culture links uh, diverse uh, community and uh, it's uh, sometimes the nature or the, sometimes the, uh, the traditional uh, festivals and the, so sometimes food culture and music and so yeah, I, I think it is such kind of multi-layered culture is a good clue to gather together. Thank you very much. So, so we have a few minutes left and I wanted to make sure we didn't um, miss one topic that I want to talk about, which was um, open source and the role of open source in a lot of the, mm -hmm. as a tool uh, for a lot of the transformation. And I know, I mean, I've talked to Audrey and Hal separately about this. And Beth, I know you've, you've, you were, I used to call you the, the officer of, open for the White House when you were there. But, um, you know, I, I, I think in, in the US, there have been, you know, some announcements of trying to get to 20% open source. So there's sort of, you know, kind of a procurement level innovation. Um, I was brainstorming with some of our digital agency um, uh, uh, senior people. And you know, there are a number of people who, who are in the digital agency who have, who have open source projects on the side. That are very useful, um, and they're they're tied to government services, but they're not rewarded for that at all, you know. And 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 so there's a couple of pieces, you know. One, how can we encourage people to do open source and and reward people for doing these side projects, and then um, and and also just from a policy perspective, um, how 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 do you integrate it? Assuming that you agree that it's important, um, I don't know if if um, anyone has any, any um, because, because we're trying to make this also a, a, one of the bullet items in the, in the report that we're going to be producing. So just any I know any when the minister sent you a pull request, uh, they are very encouraged. Yes. <laughs> that, that, could yeah, be one of the, <laughs> that could be one of the requirements for becoming minister or s senior person is you have to make a, a, a useful pull request before you get to the next phase. Yeah, that's great. And thank you for um, the pull request to, to Japan, Japanese government services. <laughs> there, there, there is, uh, no, 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 no. I'm, uh, there is, by the way, a whole uh, 
a lot of people who focus on kind of open source policy making too. And, and in terms of helping people to understand what a pull request is, it's not just code, but actually doing yeah. policy in an open source way, um, which may help to explain it. Um, I, I think, you know, in terms of the arguments, it's very helpful uh, in terms of for political leadership to understand like the, the arguments that it's, again, the right thing to do are not very helpful. The fact that it's faster and it's cheaper the fact that you know we built a new uh, business services platform and we saved easily six to twelve months by stealing code from uh, another jurisdiction and building on what they'd done. Um, you know we were able to explain you know just how much time it saved us and therefore how much money it saved us. Um, there's of course all the cybersecurity arguments, but I think really appealing to the bottom line that you're going to get the best in class uh, kinds of uh, services as a result is really, really important. But I think even more important than, um, you know, the open source code is really data interoperability and data sharing and the ability to design, you know, the whole government as a platform idea and being able to build core components and services and APIs on top of them using open data standards. Um, to be able to just accelerate innovation and digital transformation that I think is really um, is so much more important. So we've, we've found very little resistance to the push toward open source software, but we still find a very heavy lift because it's hard to explain and it's legally difficult is the data sharing um, uh, and data standard setting that we need. So we're about to do an executive order, for example, that I wrote, um, not only to mandate radical interagency data sharing, but to basically put myself in charge. So of any time somebody wants to build any kind of component that faces the public or interacts with the public, um, that they have to come to us for the standards by which they do so, and they have to develop an API first strategy. Um, so basically, we just kind of inserted ourselves in the middle by writing uh, by writing a um, you know an executive order to give us the authority to do so. We're still trying to get it out the door, um, but I think you know the speed, the cost sharing. Uh, and the and the ability to kind of uh, uh, tr you know engage in more agile transformation is something people are beginning to understand. But probably in the interest of time, easiest to uh, point you to some to some other resources uh, um, that I think are really useful on this topic. And I, I don't know, Audrey, you, you were, we, well, we talked well, a little bit about open source pull before. Requests, uh, I think it, it's also a uh, political necessity if the municipal mayor and the central government's uh, leader, the premier uh, in Taiwan's case, uh, is not the same uh, political party. Uh, actually, our Taipei mayor is a uh, leader of an opposition party. Uh, and uh, in, in many cases, uh, data sharing arrangements and open source is the only way politically that they can collaborate on things like contact tracing. Uh, because the great thing about open source collaboration is that it's uh, collaborating in a dictionary sense, like you don't have to kind of love your <laughs> collaborator, but you can still collaborate uh, with with them. So uh, basically, uh, it's constructive criticism whenever the um, MPs of an opposition party asks, okay, so why the OpenStreetMap uh, community tells us your map uh, of mask rationing is a terrible uh, data bias because you assume everyone on a helicopter, you only measure in um, km kilometer distances uh, between a person and the mask available, but in the rural places, they have to spend three hours, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then the, the minister can say, you know, it's an open API, you know, do, do something else, right? Uh, what, what would you like to do instead? And, and then that, that flips the kind of interpolation around because, uh, yeah, they have the same data and API and standards as we do. So if they think this is bad, they must create something better. And uh, in this particular case, because MP was a VP data analytics Foxconn, she actually says something better. Uh, and then we implemented that on the central government in 24 hours. 
So basically, uh, if uh, they have to submit freedom of information access requests, then we're always at a disadvantage because we could be accused of, uh, you know, selectively publish the numbers and code and so on. But because there's an existing open API pipeline that's updated every 30 seconds, uh, almost paradoxically, the public servants in the central government is not liable then because we see the machine's numbers the same time as the local people do. And we're sorry that we didn't do it well, but uh, we are now committed to amplify your local innovations to a country scale in 24 hours and so on. But that's only possible because of open standards, API and data. Thank you, Audrey. And, and this hour went very quickly and I, I'm sad that it's ending, but it was a, actually a very interesting point, Audrey, that you ended on because um, in, throughout the conversation, obviously we need both political will and democracy. Um, and it's not just about turning on making things digital. And so I hope that, you know, through this process that we're doing in the Japanese government, um, we, everyone is aware that we need, uh, we need to transform uh, the, the way we think about uh, inclusion in government, not just the mechanics. And uh, and and I uh, thank you very much. And and ho hopefully, as we go through the process, I will be pinging you guys separately to maybe help uh, and work on some of the things that we're working on in the Japanese government, because I think this is a kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity to make a big change. And I want to make sure that we. Uh, uh, maximize the positive effects of this uh, focus on on digital and uh, and not squander it so uh, thanks again for your continued participation and for joining us today i've got Nobody my booster for having us can travel so yeah also looking uh, forward okay. to okay. <laughs> yeah so maybe we can uh, get over here sometime soon um we're all looking forward to traveling finally again <laughs> uh, um, right. Yeah, we will be planning an event sometime this summer, so I'll be pinging you separately, but um, no, we can meet face to face next time over sushi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. And bubble tea, thank I'm you. sure. Okay, cheers. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you very much, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.